From 1964 to 1970, musician George Harrison and his wife, model Patty Boyd, lived at Kinforns, a large 1950s deluxe bungalow in Isha. Harrison bought Kinforns for £20,000 on the advice of one of the Beatles' accountants. Though that does not sound like much today, it does translate to over £400,000 in the year 2020. In 1969, they were anxious for the added privacy and spaciousness of the countryside. George wanted a house that would be set away from the road, offer more privacy, and would offer an opportunity for him to build his own recording studio. And for your brave valor would pains undertake Come over to Flanders and there you shall see How merry will make it, how frolic will be As soon as you... Patty spent much of 1969 looking for a new residence for them. At one point she came across Plumpton Place, an Elizabethan manor house in Plumpton, East Sussex. Unfortunately, the owner did not want to sell the estate to a pop star, so it passed hands a couple of times and was soon sold to musician Jimmy Page. It was even featured in Led Zeppelin's film The Song Remains the Same. Patty soon spotted a tiny ad in the Sunday Times for a house in Henley-on-Thames that was being used as a school. Patty went to see it and thought it was perfect for them. The original asking price was £125,000. For the benefit of perspective, in the late 1960s, the average home in England cost £10,000. Patty and George and their friend Terry Doran went to see it the next day. George loved it and put in an offer straight away for £120,000. For reasons that aren't exactly clear, he eventually paid 140,000. That is the equivalent of 2.4 million in 2020. George and Patty moved into Friar Park during March 1970. They were filled with enthusiasm for taking on the challenges that awaited them. And that perhaps is just as fascinating as anything that could be found around them. After all, George Harrison and Patty Boyd were not exactly the type of couple that one would typically expect to meet. Simply put, is there any wish that any magical genie could grant to them that they did not already possess at the time? They had fame and friends and family and fortune and by all accounts George and Patty always had hearts of gold. Their time and talents, a never-ending stream of income, could have been spent in endless ways. They could have purchased any home they wanted. They could have even built their own house to meet every single one of their needs and expectations. And from there, they could have lived a carefree, jet-setting life, entertaining any and all of their whims. But they chose another route. With great courage and initiative and drive, they chose to invest every gift that nature and nurture had bequeathed upon them, along with all the time and energy that youth affords, to engage upon a quest to rescue, from the ravages of time and neglect, the imaginative masterpiece created by Sir Frank Crisp nearly a century earlier. Patty and George had left the relatively normal world of kinfounds behind. They had answered their call to adventure, they had become characters in the story of Friar Park and were about to embark upon a hero's journey. Patty and George began their quest by researching the history of Friar Park and making plans to restore the house, the lodges and the remaining gardens to how they were in their glory days. Among their decisions was hiring well-known garden designer Beth Chatto to help them plot and plan and offer advice on planting and what sorts of botanical species would flourish in and around the lakes. George eventually hired at least eight gardeners, but additional help was needed to maintain the estate. 
So he invited the families of three Krishna devotees to move in to the estate to help. George invited his brother Harry to live in the lower lodge with his wife and children and to manage the estate, which he accepted. Their trusted friend, Terry Doran, was invited to live in the house with them. Soon after, George hired Chris O'Dell away from Apple in order to work for him directly. She too was invited to live at Friar Park. Patty spent the next four and a half years restoring the house and making it a comfortable place for her family and her friends to spend time together in the extraordinary surroundings that Sir Frank envisioned nearly a century earlier. Along the way, Patty hired David Mlinerick to assist with the interior decorating. A gifted artist named Larry Smart was hired by Patty to paint illusions, mandalas and 3D designs on some of the interior walls of the house. Patty shopped at the furniture cave on Lots Road where she had purchased sofas that she had re-sprung and re-upholstered. In the early 1970s, George Harrison installed a 16-track tape-based recording studio in a series of rooms on the second floor of the house, with wonderful views seen through the windows. Thanks to George Harrison's genius, the magic of music filled the air throughout the mansion at Friar Park. From afar, Life at the Grand Estate seemed to be filled with the stuff that fairy tales are made of. But history has proven time and again that just because people appear to be living in a fairy tale fashion doesn't necessarily mean that they are on an enchanting journey towards a fairy tale ending. In 1974, with George's blessing, his wife Patty began a romantic relationship with their friend Eric Clapton, who fell in love with her years earlier. Patty left her life at Friar Park and began a new one at Hurtwood Edge Lodge, Clapton's 1910 Italian villa-style country pile in Ewhurst, Surrey. Though a far cry from the gardens at Friar Park, there is no doubt that Patty appreciated Hurtwood's gardens that were the work of Gertrude Jekyll, the legendary British horticulturalist and designer. <laughs>